since you asked about Atlantis, I'm going to go ahead and jump on ahead a little bit. Although this Atlant, this is the Atlantis material I have collected together, and if you look at the whole thing here, you can see I've got quite a mass of information. Um, and no, I have actually never really done this program for anybody yet, um, other than bits and pieces. But usually, my my approach to this was to actually do a class or a seminar in Atlantis and as a prerequisite to the class I would have everybody read and study Plato's two dialogues Critias and Timaeus where he talks about Atlantis so if you're so moved on your own acquire those you can probably get them online you know I find the Jowett translation to be particularly good um, I don't remember his first name J-O-W-E-T-T -T, is it Benjamin Jowett, thank you. Benjamin Jowett. And the two dialogues are Timaeus and Critias. They're fairly short, and that's about 98% of our information on Atlantis. There's a few, uh, few tidbits scattered around. Proclus wrote a commentary on Crantor. Crantor, according to Proclus, wrote about Atlantis, but none of his writings still exist. But I think it was Proclus that discussed the fact that there were two pillars. In, in Egypt that Solon saw when he asked the Egyptian priests what's what's what are these inscriptions on these pillars mean and they said this is the history of Atlantis so what I've done here is I've put together Plato's account line by line with what modern research has suggested and one of the interesting things about Atlantis is and I and I quote that in in this program here is the shift in scientific thinking, uh, like if we look here, the official view of academia on Atlantis went through a major shift in the 1960s. Randall comments and says, in the 1970s, several works appeared addressing the issue of Atlantis, which purported to render an authoritative academic judgment as to the plausibility of the tale from a scientific standpoint. Of the many works written on Atlantis up to this point, the majority of them took Plato's description as reasonably accurate and looked for an Atlantean presence somewhere in the mid-Atlantic Ocean as clearly indicated in Plato's narrative. And then I have a quote, one of a number of them in Plato that would suggest its location. This power came forth out of the Atlantic Ocean. And there was an island situated in front of the straits, which are by you called the Pillars of Heracles. The region around the Azores was generally preferred as the most suitable location. However, with the publication of the aforementioned works, of which the most prominent and authoritative from a scientific point of view was probably the compilation entitled Atlantis Fact or Fiction, published in 1978, a mid-Atlantic region fell out of favor amongst researchers. A marked shift in emphasis occurs after this point when the door was opened wide to abandon one or another of Plato's very precise and specific details concerning geography, geology, timing, cultural infrastructure, and so on, in order to make some site other than a mid-Atlantic one the actual location of the fabled lost civilization. And so what we find is post-1970s, a dozen different locations being proposed, probably the most prominent being the, the Mediterranean with the, the island of Santorini, the eruption of Terra, the volcano destroying Santorini, possibly destroying the, the, the Minoan civilization on the island of Crete. Turkey has been proposed. Southern England has been proposed. Antarctica has been proposed. Cuba, Cuba has been proposed. Yeah, in fact, I made a listing, and I think I had a dozen different ones, other than the area where Plato initially was pointing to. And why did that happen? Well, the reason it happened, um, yeah, as a result of this shift, dozens of locations were proffered as the actual site of Atlantis, requiring modification of Plato's original account to a greater or lesser degree. The question must be asked, how far can one legitimately alter the details of the narrative and still be referring to something called Atlantis? After all, if the creature does not in fact look like a duck or walk like a duck or quack like a duck, then we can, can assume that whatever it might be, it's no duck. 
<clears throat> at this point, if the student has not read Critias and the relevant sections of Timaeus, he or she should do so before proceeding. But we will proceed a little bit into this. In any case, the next section of this program introduces the seeker of knowledge to the prevailing academic view regarding Atlantis. Unfortunately, a considerable number of Atlantis researchers have been less than rigorous in their observance of the protocols of good science, particularly those of a New Age or channeled variety, thus leading, lending ammunition to the defenders of official dogmas in their attempts to preempt serious scientific research into the question of Atlantis. This was the, this was the thing that began to really this was a group of geologists got together in the 70s and said, we're going to put an end to this nonsense, this heresy about Atlantis once and for all. And they said that inasmuch as all references to Atlantis stem from Plato and no other source, in deciding whether it is fact or fiction, or to put it another way, whether it is legend or myth, we are faced with three options. We can take everything Plato says quite literally, or we can take his words seriously, but not literally, or we can take Atlantis as purely and simply his invention. Which of those three options do you think they came down? Third. The third one, yes. That it was just purely and simply his invention. And uh, what they did was they went back to Ignatius Donnelly in his book from 1882 and used that. They basically neglected everything that had been written since. As it turns out, though, I think Ignatius Donnelly's concept was actually more accurate than the geologists of 1978 when they were writing. Uh, since that book, any of you guys ever read this or seen it? You have it? Yeah. It's, since that book is still being sold in bookstores everywhere and has provided the basis for numerous other works, it is desirable to explain why his literal interpretation of Plato's disc description is utterly inconsistent with modern scientific knowledge. Donnelly outlined 13 propositions in support of which he then proceeded to marshal all kinds of evidence. Only two of these propositions are relevant to a geologically oriented discussion. So here's their trick. Well, here's the two propositions that have geological implications. That there once existed in the Atlantic Ocean, opposite the mouth of the Mediterranean Sea, a large island which was the remnant of an Atlantic continent and known to the ancient world as Atlantis. Proposition two, that Atlantis perished in a terrible convulsion of nature in which the whole island sunk into the ocean with nearly all of its inhabitants. So what they then proceed to do is marshal geological arguments to say that these two couldn't have happened. <clears throat> but remember, there were 13 propositions. So then what they do is they conveniently sidestep the remaining 11 because they say, well, if the geological ones can't be true, then none of the other 11 are true either. We've just, we've just eliminated the whole concept of Atlantis by showing that the geology makes no sense and therefore all of the others disappear magically just like that. What I have done in this particular program is to marshal the actual scientific evidence, both before and since this was written. And as you can see here, I've got quite a mass of it, and I don't know if these people are still alive or not, but we could pick any one of these and we could go in and I could show you that there's overwhelming evidence that there is in fact a sunken landmass in the mid-Atlantic. It's overwhelming. that there is, And there's a plausible scientific explanation for how it sunk and why it sunk. And think about what we've been talking about in terms of the end of the Ice Age and this rapid rising of sea level. Remember the concept of isostasy that I told you about? You're sitting on your comfy chair, causing a depression in the cushion, and when you get up off the chair, it rebounds. Okay, now, if you think about the globe as a whole unified system, what you've got is the planet is constantly trying to attain equilibrium so that the distribution of mass rotating about its center of gravity stays symmetrical and consistent. The idea being if one area is depressed, picture this. Well, I actually used this as a demonstration one time. I took a big beach ball. I said, what happens if we squeeze it this way? It bulges this way, doesn't it? And if you're actually to take all the radii of that distended sphere and average them, they would be the same as the original radius of the of the round sphere of the beach ball, right? What this says is this. 
If you take part of the global crust and depress it, as you would under an enormous weight of ice, somewhere else has to bulge outwards. When you remove that enormous mass of ice, allowing that depressed section of the global crust to rebound, somewhere else has to then contract to compensate. Where do you think it will contract most logically? Well, right along the zone of least resistance, which is the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. That's the point where the planet breathes in and out. And you can think of the ice age, the glacial interglacial ice age as being part of this planetary rhythm. The planet is breathing in and breathing out on this 12,900 year cycle. It breathes in, it breathes out. As it does, sections of the Earth's crust rise and fall. <clears throat> Yes. Are you saying that the Mid-Atlantic Ridge is, uh, there's no equivalent in the Pacific Ocean? There's, there's nothing that is doing this? Oh, there are many other ridges, but yeah, no, the whole planet is doing that. The whole planet along the, along the, the continental, along the, the plate oh, boundaries. The plate boundaries, so it's got to be breathing going on. Yes, yes, all over the whole planet. All right. But, but along the Mid-Atlantic Ridge is a zone where it's going to be particularly concentrated right there because it's the nature of the structure of that ridge itself and we can pull it up right here and you can see it do you think this ridge actually if we had the capacity to go down there and check it we would be able to see or feel or or somehow sense something different about this ridge over the other ones only only its magnitude and its length and its disposition in the very center of the Atlantic Ocean and at the Atlantic Ocean being a recipient of the bulk of the glacial meltwater. Right. But all the other, all the other, uh, oh, like, like clearly, will still have the same because, gas, gases, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, it, when the ice melts, that sea level rise of 400 feet is global. Mm -hmm. So that's adding a huge amount of weight to all of the ocean bottoms. And in fact, I think not having made studies of the other plate boundaries and what their effects were, the post-glacial effects, I couldn't really answer, give you an authoritative answer to that question. I have studied, when you look at all of this stuff that I've amassed here, it does concern the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. And the studies that have been done along the Mid-Atlantic Ridge that do in fact suggest that that suture zone has been doing this. And there's many lines of evidence converging on that conclusion. All right, so it's not the only one. Correct. Correct. But I will plead ignorance on the others because this is the only one that I have studied in depth. Is this more of a emergence or a subjection zone? Some, some red this, is a, this is a divergent zone. Okay. This is not a subduction zone. Emerging outward. Right. Yes. In the picture, the, the, I know you're going to explain something here, and I don't want to push ahead, but in the picture you showed with the glacial mass on the planet. Yes. I was wondering who might notice that. Libby is the one. She noticed, yes. What, did you show it again? Uh, yeah, but I, I, you know, I may have it right here. Here's the Mid-Atlantic Ridge running down this way. Here's Iceland. Iceland, I believe, is a modern analog to what Atlantis would have been during the Ice Age. It's a chunk of continental material flanking the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. The rocks of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge are primarily oceanic basalts. However, right here, there is a mass of granitic continental type rock that was once part of the African plate, the African plate. Well, yeah, because you got a picture that plate tech, continental drift, if we go back 65 to 80 million years, we got to close up the Atlantic Ocean. Well, over the last 65 to 80 million years, the Atlantic Ocean has been opening and spreading. And as it's been opening, certain chunks of some of the continents have been left behind, like the Azores Plateau, as it's called right here, con consisting of rocks that were primarily part, once part of Africa, got left behind. What was the composition called? Granitic. Granite. Granite, granite. granite. yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. If you know anything about your geology, that is somewhat That's amazing. Anomal anomalous. Yeah. So all along the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, this is like a great crack that runs halfway around the world. 
It's the longest uh, fracture in the crust. It's the longest fracture known in the crust. Okay, let's go through here. Here's a closer view of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. It's vertically exaggerated, right? Here. Brandon, what time cycle would you guesstimate Atlantis to be? I would say that probably it would have existed, if you figure, if the if the last interglacial terminated around 26,000 years ago, when sea level drops and the weight is removed from the Atlantic Basin, that allows the floor of the Atlantic Ocean to come up. And I would guess that Atlantis, if it was a civilization, would have endured for roughly 12 or 13,000 years from the onset of the last glacial cycle to the termination of the last glacial cycle. Well, yes, actually, Plato gives the date of 11,600 years, which is actually a date that's turned up in, in um, scientific research repeatedly. There was actually a great climate spasm 